Hello, everyone. We're so happy to see you today. Thank you for being here. I'm Carrie Schmidt. I'm the principal of Plentiful, which works with nonprofit organizations. And I am also proud to serve on the CMC Board of Trustees and I'm chair of the Resource and Development Committee. Thank you today uh, to today's forum sponsors, the United Way of Central Ohio, Rama Consulting, Crab Brown and, Lane, and James. Thank you for your gracious host, the Ellis, and thank you for all of your gener generous support. We're also grateful to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting our live stream being carried right now through our social media platforms. All right, so let's dive in. Welcome to today's forum, Reimagining a Style Giant. Donna James is among Ohio's most successful and admired executives. Her current challenge may be among the most significant in her career, helping an Ohio-based global fashion icon reimagine and reinvent itself after decades of astounding growth and calls for change. As, a board, as the board chair for Victoria's Secret and Company, James is helping set the VS & Co. ship on a new course towards greater inclusivity while working to win over new generations of younger customers who have their own diverse definitions of beauty. Today, we'll reflect on career journeys and dive into the challenges setting a globally recognized brand up for success with a new generation of customers in an ever-changing fashion world. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's distinguished panelists. Please help me welcome Donna James, Chair of, board, Chair of the Board of Victoria's Secret Company and Managing Director of Lardin & Associates, Lydia Smith, Chief Diversity Officer for Victoria's Secret and Company, and our host, an incredibly accomplished fashion leader in her own right, Kimberly Miner, the CEO of Bumbershoot. You can read all about, yeah, let's clap for them now. We can't hold it back, we're just very excited for it. Uh, you can read all about the, the today's panelists uh, via the QR code uh, that we mentioned earlier, and let's get going. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. So hello, everyone. And uh, I'm super excited to be here. And I, we have so many questions. And I know you all have a lot of questions. So I'm going to jump right in. And let's see where this conversation takes us, OK? Sounds good. Wonderful. OK, so Donna, my first question is for you. So can you, let's just start light, OK? So can you discuss a pivotal moment in your career that helped define your trajectory? That's light, huh? <laughs> well, that, that tells you how our conversation is going to go. So um, first of all, thank you. And thank you for having me and us and a brand that we love um, and people love to talk about. So that's a big piece of why we're here. We're here. A pivotal moment. There are so many. Um, one was an intersection of doing what you love, but not to the point it takes you out of here. So one pivotal moment in my career was um, right at the pinnacle peak of success, doing what I wanted to do at Nationwide, running five businesses, one an international company, another in the banking industry, very diverse financial services companies. Uh, my body decided to shut down, and I had a stroke. I was 46, 47 years old. Uh, my wonderful husband, who I just knew in a crisis he would not know what to do, he knew what to do. Um, and I found myself doing the thing I loved, um, making a difference, turning around five very different businesses, fast fail, fast scale, had a venture capital fund looking at um, opportunities in financial services that were emerging and could be opportunities for our company in that. And my body said, I'm tired. And he found me on the bathroom floor. I was awake, um, and, but I couldn't speak, and I was paralyzed on my right side. So I came out of it almost as if it never happened, except it did happen. And it's a precursor for a major stroke. Couldn't tell me why, no history in my family. So I decided I needed to step back. Not for a week, not for two weeks. I'd been working at the company for 25 years. I had just gotten back from uh, working, uh, speaking with uh, Coca-Cola Enterprises about joining their board. 
and I turned them down and gave my boss notice that a year, first I told him six months and then he kept trying to get me to stay. I said, stay through the year. It was the best thing I could have done. When one door closes, whether you close it yourself or something presses upon you to close it, there is another one open. You just cannot see it. And what it opened me up into, and I know you can relate to this, is starting my own company um, to do the thing I love, you know, helping businesses and leaders get to their best next because that's what I was doing with the five businesses and the venture capital fund. So that was a pivotal change for me, and that uh, started uh, Lardon and Associates in 2006. I'll let you guess what Lardon stands for. Just think about it. Larry and Donna, really? Yeah, that could be right. So, okay, so based on that, we know that starting your own company is not slowing down, right? And so... I'm still confused, but yes, you're absolutely right. And it's not retirement, yeah. Right, it's, it's definitely not retirement. Um, so in doing that, and that was 2006, and I know you have ramped up since 2006 and you're very busy. So my next question is, when they asked you to be the chairperson of Victoria's Secret and Company's board, why? Did you decide to do that? Yeah, what about that? So many of you may be aware, I've been on the board for a number of years, but a lot of history, seeing the ups and downs, and we were in a moment where we needed to pivot. And we were looking at selling the company, at least 50% of it, and COVID hit. And a lot of things changed, and that be the plan A, then we pivoted to plan B, which was to spin the business out, value creation for our shareholders, and continued growth and, and ability to serve our customer in a very different way. I'm working hard trying to make sure what I love to do is support making sure the right things happen, whether it's individually or in business, and those of you who know me know that's just how I'm wired was not expecting to be asked. And you sort of know when there's been a meeting before the meeting and they've been talking about you and you think you know about the meetings before the meetings, but I missed this one. And we're on a Zoom or Microsoft Teams call and it's the committee that makes these decisions in spinning out a company. And the chair says to me, so Donna, um, would you be interested in chairing the board? I like, oh, yeah, right. I laughed because, you know, we were very collegial and I thought they were just having fun. Nobody smiled but me. <laughs> they were very serious and I knew, oh. And the interesting thing about the decision, it wasn't any concern in my mind about whether I could do the job because I've learned in moving into new roles, there are things you have to learn and there are things you know. So don't be afraid of what you've got to learn. You've just got to figure that piece out. It was whether I wanted to do it or not and the why behind it. And it appealed to my biggest why. I talked to my consultants, three very trusted advisors, um, my husband, Yvette McGee-Brown, um, swore them to secrecy. And one gentleman who's not here, Steve Davis, good friend, uh, great colleague, and they were saying, so why are you even thinking about this, Don? Of course, you should do it. And it appealed to my why, um, to help people and organizations get to their best next, because best next is on the way to where you should be. And no matter where you are, there's always a better next. And so I said yes, it was about transformation, and I love transformation. So, um, yeah, and I'm loving the job, and it is a job. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, so um, what I hear is that you created a personal board of directors, right? And, and that helped I did. you. Right? And that's something that I talk about all the time, that we need to have our own personal board of directors to have those people that we trust who can lead us. And so thank you for those of you who helped her. <laughs> um, Lydia, I was going to ask you a different question, but you're at a different stage of your career. 
And um, I think it would be very interesting to understand, A, who is your personal board of directors, and B, what, what has been your pivotal why? Um, so <clears throat> my uh, personal board of directors, actually uh, my mentor, the boss that hired me into my first role, uh, and she's been on my personal board of directors from the beginning because she saw me before, so she knows who I am at my core and what are my values, so I know that the advice that she gives me is based on what she knows about my values, not what she thinks or what other people from the outside are looking in. Um, and of course, I have my parents and some other business mentors along the way that you know I really trust and value, uh, but I really go to her first because she's, she's seen me all the way through. Um, and she actually was a big part of the most pivotal moment in my career. So to your point, I'm earlier in my career now, but at the very beginning, very early, not long after um, I graduated from college, I was working at GE, had just gotten selected to be a part of this amazing leadership development program, um, had the ability to travel around the world doing work that I loved. I was in IT at the time. And I found out I was pregnant with not one, but two. <clears throat> two, two girls. Um, and so at that point in time, I had no idea how I was gonna manage a career and a family. And I remember going into her office and just saying, so I need you to give me the easiest rotation next time around. So I was in a leadership development program and you do six month rotations. And I said, I, I'm pregnant and then I'm gonna have the girls. I need you to give me the easiest rotation. I don't wanna quit, but I don't think I'll be able to do this. And she's like, that's actually not what we're gonna do. We're gonna give you the hardest rotation and you're gonna show all of these leaders that you can manage raising your daughters and doing the hardest rotation. And that was the most pivotal moment in my career because had, had she allowed me to take the easy way out, I'd still be doing that now. Um, but that forced me to figure out how I was gonna manage. It wasn't always gonna look pretty. I wasn't always gonna feel like I made the right choice. There's a lot of mom guilt here and there along the way. Um, but I figured out how to make choices that make the most sense for me and my career and my family. And I've been able to do that since then, which has allowed me to take roles like this role um, that are very demanding, but I love the work and I'm passionate about it. My family understands um, what that means and the sacrifices that we all have to make. And I don't know that we would have got here that I could be doing this had I not started on that trajectory at the beginning of my career. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I know you're here because you want to hear about Victoria's Secret. I know that. But I also know that there are a lot of people out here who have to hear what the journey looks like. So thank you for indulging me. Um, so Donna, now we're going to jump into okay. Victoria's Secret. Okay, so we know that Victoria's Secret is one of Central Ohio's most well-known retail success stories. It was. And as America changed, the brand fell out of step a little bit, right? They kind of lost sight of who their consumer was. And so getting back in step with those consumers has meant a huge turnaround. What, um, what is this new direction? Can you give us some light into the new direction and tell us how do you transform a brand that is so, it's global, you have people all over the world, the brand stands for things differently all over the world. How do you do a turnaround in that scenario? How much time do we have? <laughs> Take as much time as you need. <laughs> um, so I guess the first part of this is what's changed. And when you miss a customer segment because you have an idea and you think that idea is going to resonate with everyone, and maybe that idea has in the past, the world changes, and you miss the signal that the world has changed. And you say, so are you blind? Are you deaf? Or sometimes you can be so enamored with what you're doing and how well it's working that the shift gets missed. Not that you don't see it, but how much of it do you believe in? Let me give you an example that is nothing to do with Victoria's Secret, because it happens every time. We just happen to be you know, the, 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 the leader, and still a market leader, and so when leaders miss, people pay more attention. Remember when water 
used to be something you get out of a fountain and not in a bottle that you could buy anywhere. And you remember when beverage organizations were not selling water? They missed the shift, but they quickly did a pivot, quickly reprioritized in their brand, and now you've got so many waters, you think they all taste different and they probably don't. My husband and I have this debate all the time, you know, the kind of water he likes versus I. So I'm just giving you that as an example to say it happens to lots of businesses. And the trick in every business is to catch the new wave. Catch it before you know, it takes over. Because like an ocean, there are always waves of change that you have to tap into. No different than us as individuals catching the waves of change in our individual lives and being aware. Um, or no, no different than a good shoe sale. You feel real bad when you miss it, but another one's coming, so get ready. Um, that's me and how I get by sometimes when I miss the big shoe sale. So that is the, the in and out of the story. And it's huge when you're a company of this size. People think um, we've lost our way and we've lost our customer. No, 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 no. The pivot has happened. What we are doing now, better than we did before, is something very simple, but very important and not always easy for companies to do, listening. Because listening isn't just the act of sitting in this room, hearing what I'm saying, and I hear what you say. Listening is an action, it's a verb. It's a test and try, sometimes you get it right and you don't, but you're still listening, so you figure it out. And in this retail market, whether it's global, whether it's national here in the US, there are shifts going on all over the place. Shifts economically, shifts demographically, shifts in fashion. Um, I have some things in my closet that I bought 20 years ago and somebody saw me today and said, oh my God, where did you get that? I was almost ashamed to tell her. But it goes around, but you've got to stay on top of the shifts, and that's what we're focused on now. And not just externally, but internally. If you're going to change a brand, you, it's inside out. It's no different than if I want to change who I am to the world. I can tell you, but I can't do it unless I show you, and in large organizations, the show starts with the employees. And it better not be a show, it better be for real, because they will call you on it. Authenticity and alignment around what you're trying to accomplish, acknowledging the things that didn't go so well, because if you can't own up to missteps, you can't figure out the next one. And when you make the next misstep, if you're so busy trying to hide it, you can't get better. Um, I work with a group called the African American Leadership Academy, and we have uh, a kind of an ethos around efficacy and being effective. And if you're going to be your most effective self, you've got to be focused on improving and not just proving to people. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges we have right now. So many segments want us to prove we're different, prove we've changed, and that's a conversation. We've got to show it, and that's what we've been doing. But it starts internally with the employees um, and working on who we are inside to the outside. And I think when you do the work to improve, those moments to prove it come organically. So we are two and a half years into a DEI strategy that focuses on people first. It's people experience purpose naturally, because we were focusing on people and building relationships, it's just now, two and a half years later, that those relationships are starting to come to fruition. So now you're seeing stories about cotton impact reports and work that we're doing with black-owned cotton farms and things like that. That's two years in the making. That didn't just happen the week before when the article came out. We've been doing that work behind the scenes because there was a, an organic, but a real and authentic desire to drive economic empowerment. So we were building the relationships already to be able to do it. So that's why you have to start, if you want something to be sustainable, you have to start with that improving step. You can't just jump to proving to people and wanting to be out there and get the notoriety and get all the shine, because it won't last. Yeah. So, me, can I add one yeah. thing to that um, very quickly? 
A big piece of the shift was figuring out what does inclusivity look like to us, to our employees, to our customers, and moving in that direction, you know, people talk about inclusivity, especially with fashion and lingerie, to be body size and shape. Sure, that's the visual part of it, but there's more to it than that. There's more to inclusivity with customers, yes, reflecting who they are in your product, in who you have wearing that product, but also creating a sense of inclusivity and belonging with the employees. Um, because they're the face to the customer, whether it's digital or it's in a store. And you all can recognize we're not the only one. Some were earlier to that shift, some were later, but it's a shift. And trust me, there are people fighting against it, <laughs> and there are people fighting for it. Everybody has a point of view, but you have to be clear about your North Star. You don't ignore what you're, what's out there, but you don't let it derail you unless it's something that is very important that you may have missed. And that discernment between what's critical, what's relevant, and what's noise is not easy. But that's how I think about it. Because it's all noise. It's all noise. It all right. sounds like noise in the right. beginning. You're absolutely It's all noise. Well, you, may, you brought up some great points, um, so I'm going to go off my cards. So um, the, idea, <laughs> the idea of you know, changing the brand, changing the culture, and then also understanding the importance of inclusivity right, and equity. And this is something that's really near and dear to my heart, because I know I was introduced as the CEO of Bumbershoot, but I'm also the CEO of the Women of Color Retail Alliance. And our focus is on making sure that we are represented, but not just as on the front lines, right? And not just in the distribution centers. So I really like uh, Lydia, if you could take a few minutes just to talk about what does that look like? What is the path to change the complexion of the leadership so that not just reflecting the, the customer in marketing and in the stores, but reflecting it in the decision makers? That's a great question. So what I would say is the biggest point is pipeline. And I think that's actually why you are starting to see a lot of um, companies being called out or just the industry in general because you know, 2020 was this year, everybody made these big commitments, talked about all these things that they were going to do, and then here we are three, three years later, did we do them, yes or no? And the reason why I believe a lot of that fell short was because there wasn't actual intention around building a pipeline and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, when you start to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, the first thing they think about is diversity, and then the next thing they think about is recruiting. So where are we going to go? We're going to go to HBCUs, and we're going to recruit diverse talent from those HBCUs. Well, one, how are you going to retain that talent once they get to your company? Do you even have a company that they would want to come to, that they would stay? What's the turnover going to be? And then that's where the culture piece comes. That's why culture is so important. You have to have a culture that's going to retain the talent. Otherwise, you have an open door of people coming in and out. And if people are coming in and out, then you don't have the diverse talent in leadership to mentor people in middle management and people starting off in their career. People that are early in their career don't see people that look like them. They don't think and see the path for them to get there, so they leave and go somewhere else. So now you have this revolving door. Um, so th the, the work of the work is creating an inclusive environment, one where your leaders feel accountability, not just for the performance of the business in meeting the metrics and the goals of the business, but also how they develop talent, how they treat talent. They have to have a sense of responsibility and accountability around that. It's not just the CDO's job or the CEO's job, it's leadership. Um, so all of those things play into our companies able to both attract and retain diverse talent, and then also the resources. Um, we know that there are systemic biases that exist, whether they're conscious or unconscious, in corporate America at every company, and those prevent challenges for women in particular, people of color, women of color, to have opportunities for development. 
So if you aren't being intentional about directing resources to the development of those underrepresented individuals, you're going to lack their ability, to, their ability to get to the top is going to lack. And you'll see it in your succession plans. So we've been really intentional about embedding diversity, equity, and inclusion into every aspect of the business. That goes from internal talent, um, leadership development, our L&D processes, as well as then how it shows up in the business from products to our marketing. But we know that if it's not a throughput into every piece of the business, then when we put people in those roles, they won't have a voice. They won't. It won't be authentic, right? And what's the point of putting someone who's bringing diverse perspectives at a, at a table, giving them a seat at the table, but then their voice can't be heard? So we have to do that work, you know, in every function of the business. And can I add a piece to that? Because we're not here talking about this because we're perfection. Um, you know, the enemy of progress is perfection. We're talking about it because we're intentional about progress. And one of the things I've learned is you can't, if you have an organization that culturally isn't aligned around development of people, building a pipeline of talent, I mean all talent, what happens is, you, you, not just people of color suffer, everybody does. Because it's not a discipline around a value that you say you hold, everyone becomes subject to it. Um, and there are unwritten rules in every organization that you should not have to learn in order to be positioned, right? But if you don't have a discipline or an expectation around development for everyone, certain ones of us become the canaries in the coal mine and miss out. And so I like the notion of what you have to do internally and what leaders have to believe. I call it being patiently persistent because it doesn't happen overnight. Lydia and I get to stand in rooms and people go, so where's everybody else? Well, there are more, it's not just the two of us, but um, it's a legitimate question to ask and be prepared to talk about the progress you have to make because it's the long game, it's the long-term value creation in an organization, much like long-term value creation when you're talking to, to investors. So just to put a little data about to what Donna just spoke about, and this is according to the most recent um, McKinsey retail women in the workplace, um, at the senior vice president and C-suite level, women are 38% of that number. Women of color are six. And when we look at women of color, we consider Hispanic, Asian, black, indigenous, native. So all those groups, 6%. And that's, that's, the, that's the heavy lift. That's the journey, right? Because you have such a big gap to close. So just wanting to get everyone a point of reference. So there are some other really innovative things that are happening at um, Victoria's Secret, like the VS Collective, right? Very different than anything they've ever done before. I know there have been loyalty programs and there's been you know, ambassador programs and college programs, but the VS Collective is bringing very well-known women to the table. Can, would either of you like to talk about? So it's interesting because what we talk about is being able to celebrate and champion all women, right, at every stage and every day of their lives. And really when you think about the collective, it's this diverse group of women who represent so many different perspectives of life, right? And that's really what we're really working to do is to be able to if it's you know the day of your wedding, if it's your first raw, if it is you know uh, um, a special occasion, if it is um, you're going to a sporting event, whatever it is, we want you to think of Victoria's Secret, and we want you to be able to see yourself in our brand, right? Um, and I think that that's really a big part of what the collective does is it helps to show that we are no one thing. Um, and I think that is different than maybe what people have seen before with our brand. Uh, they have a vision, they have an idea <clears throat> of who we are, what we are, who we represent, and what that looks like. 
and not just through the collective, but through so many of our different initiatives, right? Our, our world tour um, this past year, which was a, a global initiative that showcased global creatives from all over the world. Um, we just recently launched a, our first ever adaptive collection for, um, you know, which was made with women with physical disabilities in mind with magnetic front closures with our bra, but when you think about it, we all probably know someone in our lives who could, ta who could uh, take advantage of having a bra with a front closure, right? You may not have a physical disability, maybe you have a neurological disability, or maybe you um, just have a hard time putting on a bra and turning it all around and doing all of that, like, and you just want comfort and ease, and this bra gives you that. Um, so there are a lot of things that I believe that we're doing with the foundation and intent is this meets women at different stages in their lives. This represents a broad group, a diverse group of women, and this really goes to show we are no one thing. Um, and no one can put us in a category and make us one thing. What I also love about the notion of the collective it's not this stagnant group of the same, you know, persons all the time. It's evolving. The interest of our customers, the interest of her, she, um, it evolves. And we have to be ready to ebb and flow with that. So the whole notion of the collective not only gives us that flexibility, but it gives the women in the collective the same flexibility. And they get to be all of themselves, not just the part that talks about VS and Co. And there's sometimes some upside to that for us, and then there's sometimes some things that we have to recognize and be um, okay with the fact that people are speaking their minds and they have a point of view. Not everyone thought Doja Cat was a great selection for the world tour. What a phenomenal country. Conversation piece, not conversation piece, but thought piece and thinking styles and approach to life. And if you want people to be authentic, you've got to accept them for completely for who they are, not just the pieces and parts that you agree with. I had relatives in my family when I mentioned, you know, we finally could talk about it. It was killing me because we couldn't talk about it for a while. We're like, oh, this is great, and, and here's why. And then someone would find one thing somebody had said that was a problem. Isn't that what we do today in society? So what we're able to do, I think, in our diversity and inclusivity in that, and an outward look as well as in, is elevate conversations that sometimes that are uncomfortable. Um, but the women who gravitate to our product and to our brand, they're in those uncomfortable and sometimes comforting conversations, and that's okay. It's, it's more than okay. I think it's necessary, right? Yes. It's necessary. So um, there's a lot that you, we've covered. You're doing a lot, right? You're doing the most right now. And so how do you handle that dashboard, right? You've got business over here. You need to turn that around, turn the brand around. You need to do better than last year. <laughs> you need to hit these EBITDA numbers. And oh, we need to change the culture. Oh, and not only the culture, we need to change how we address the culture. And oh, you didn't like that? Oh, we have to address that as well. So when you think of all of those things, what do you think is the most sustainable and what you will be known for? Everything you just said. <laughs> um, I guess it depends on your point of view in the organization. Um, and, and, and that's hard, so I'm not trying to avoid the answer, I'm trying to be as honest about it. So for me, um, what I pay the most attention to, which is undergirded by all of those things that you say, is are we resonating with her? And resonating with her is not just about the purchase, but do we have a circular conversation with her in terms of if she wants something, she doesn't, do we know why? And is she coming to us for every part of her day 
because lingerie is one of the most personal items a woman can have, and every day when we get up, we make a decision, and the decision starts there. Now, some of us think long and hard about it, and then there are others of us that everything in our lingerie is black, so we don't have to think about it. Uh, I'm not saying I know a person like that, I'm just saying there are some people who are that way. But it's a very intimate decision. And what's going, I'm going to be looking at and thinking about, are we resonating with her and are we resonating with our own employees from a culture standpoint? Because yes, being on the board, I have to pay attention to investors and I do the more than pay attention to them. But what they expect is a return on their investment. But if that formula between the internal and external doesn't work, the return's not gonna be there. Um, and so I see a tight connection um, there. So I'll take it from that perspective. Okay. Sounds good. So I just got the wrap it up um, from Doug. Um, can I ask one more question? Okay. So my last question. Imagine this. December 6, 2025, and we're back here. What's the one thing that you're gonna be so proud to share about your journey with Victoria's Secret? We said this a few times, but it'll be that we listened. It will be that, you know, when people are talking about our brand, um, they're talking about those shifts. They're talking about the things that we intended to get right and we got it kind of right, but there may have been a, a little miss there or, um, you know, the ups and downs that we know that will happen in business. They will say that we listened. We listened to our associates and we have proof points to show that we heard and we did the work and we listened to our customers and we have those same proof points to show that we did the work. I think that everything that we are doing now is a product of the fact that we're listening, not that we are sitting in a room just coming up with ideas on our own, um, but we're listening to our customers, we're listening to our associates, and we'll have a bunch of great proof points to show that by 2025. Wow, so much. You asked some great hard questions. Um, so as I sit here and I think about that, this is a year later, what am I gonna be excited about? I'm gonna be excited about the growth. And growth you know, covers a wide spectrum. My personal growth, um, because stepping into this role as a chair of a board is wonderful, uh, but it is work. Working directly with a phenomenal CEO and management team, which makes it, not only enjoyable, but uh, something where you can see and feel the progress happening because you're all on the same page. Um, so I will be looking to be able to talk about the growth uh, personally, growth of the business, growth in our connection with um, the customer, and growth in things that are mundane but so critical, our infrastructure, our supply chain, I mean, there's so much that goes on behind the scene to make that beautiful puffer jacket that you know pink has online happen and get here and get everywhere across the world. It's, it's, it sounds mundane to the person because nobody's thinking about that, but behind the scenes, if the technology isn't working, if the store's not in the right place, if the supply chain, as we saw in COVID, falls apart, we have problems. Um, so I'm looking for growth in all of those facets, personally and professionally in the business and the people in the business, which is the most fun. Yeah. So thank you both. So now, you know, with CMC, you get to ask questions. And so in the back, Doug is at that microphone. So if you have questions, please feel free to line up at the microphone. And then if anyone who is on the live stream, if you can send those questions in and Doug is going to manage all of that for us. So please. Uh, Kimberly, thank you and thank you to today's panelists. Um, this is a very well-dressed crowd here today, by the way. I just wanna, <laughs> wanna point that out. Um, question, um, in the past, Victoria's Secret seemed to create its own definition of beauty. Now things seem somewhat reversed. 
Today's Victoria's Secret seems uh, much more open to embracing beauty as its customers define it. Would you say that's accurate? And who defines beauty today at Victoria's Secret? I think you, the, first, the question answered itself. She has to define beauty for herself. That, oh my goodness, yeah. I, how I want to look today is up to me. And what I bring uh, along to help me with that, it's my choice. It's my way. Um, there are some iconic things about this brand that people will associate with beauty, but it's a feeling as much as it is a look. Um, but there is no one way to define beauty. And, and that's the beauty and the trick of it, is keeping up with what she sees and making sure she has what she needs to support that vision of herself. Um, no one wants to be told, you know, this is beauty. It comes from here. Um, and we want to help her, help her grow that. Um, so I, I think the question sort of answered itself. It has to be defined by her. The problem is, is when somebody else is trying to tell you what it looks like. The piece that I would add to that is that there is this, I think, notion that there's one person sitting in a big room overlooking everything and they define all things that have to do with our brand when the reality is we have very collaborative teams who are working together across every facet of the business and we have created and are working to continue to create an inclusive culture where those individuals can bring their voice and their perspective to the table. And so while that definition of beauty comes from inside, we have a team of consumer insights experts who are listening to what's happening in the marketplace. We have focus groups, surveys, and we're listening to our customer and they're bringing that insight and data back to our team teams who are responsible for creative and marketing and our products. So it's not just one person's viewpoint and what they think. Um, that, that definition of beauty and how we not only define it, but how it shows up um, for our brand is a collaborative effort. Good afternoon, Landon Adams. I'm here with the uh, African American Leadership Academy and I'm uh, professionally director of maturity at the New Salem Baptist Church. Uh, my question, Kimberly, actually was sparked when you provided the stats around women and particularly women of color in the fashion industry. And I was struck how gendered fashion usually is at an early age. And I wonder what can we do to help shape culture? I've got two young girls. Like, if I encourage them in their fashion interests at this age, how do I make sure that they're also prepared to go into industry and also people in our influence that would try to keep women out of the industry that again, ironically, at, at an early age is very gendered toward them. I'm just I'm curious to how that happens and what we in the room might be able to do uh, to prevent that as generations come in the future. Yes, oh, are you asking me my perspective? Oh, you can. okay, I'll take that. <laughs> so, um, there's a, that, that's packed. So I don't know if you can really guide young women to anything other than what they are naturally um, interested by. Um, you know, I happen to be um, the daughter of a fashion model. So I started reading W and I had subscriptions to WWD by the time I was 10, right? Um, but I didn't think I wanted to be in this industry. It kind of fell on me. And I think that we need to look beyond gender, right? We need to really look at people, little people, for who they are and what they want to be interested in. I don't think that you can control it from that perspective. What needs to happen is that the people who are at the top need to be more like Donna, right? And other people who are open to new people, new ideas, and new approaches. Because what we've seen, and, and there's more data, in the past 12 months in fashion and retail, women at the top have been replaced by men five to one. So like those things need to change to allow your daughters and anyone else who's interested in this industry to come into the industry, make the difference, make their mark, and move up through. So, 
that's where the change needs to happen. You just need to support your girls for whatever they want to do. Because you know, like with the VS Collective, Megan Rapino to Priyanka Chopra Jonas, right? Broad, very broad, and that, that's what it really should be. That's what fashion's about. The one thing I would add is just keep reminding them what you're already telling them. They can be and do whatever they choose. And to stay curious. We've talked about this word curiosity. You know, next to confidence, curiosity is a value and a virtue to be developed. So they can be whatever they choose to be. I was actually gonna build on the confidence piece. I think competence and confidence, right? And so often it's one or the other. And you know, you can get dead set on a particular area of expertise and yet you go so deep that you go into a room and you don't have the confidence to speak up to share what you know. Or it's the other way around, it's the loudest person in the room that actually doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah. But so I would say encouraging them is their they're searching and they're learning and they're, you know, that curiosity that, that they have both, that they're developing their inner confidence in who they are and what they bring to the table and that voice that they have, that unique perspective that no one else um, can come to a table with, but also developing that ex area of expertise within, if it ends up being fashion or anything else, what's their area of expertise, what's their niche? So one more thing, one more thing with that, to your point. But don't push them into it because they appear to have an aptitude, like let that develop naturally. Because you'll see what really is going to come to be. Um, I have a four-year-old, so thank you for all of that. Um, my name is Jessica Flowers. I'm from the Columbus Council on World Affairs. Uh, you were talking a little bit about culture shifts in your organization. I'm just curious, um, you've talked about inclusivity and your DEI work. Do you have any other goals around culture shifts in your organization? And then along with that, what challenges have you run into in trying to shift culture, and how have you overcome those challenges? So one of the things that I try to pay attention to, and the entire leadership team, because we, we talk about this, especially in the board room, and when we, and I know the ELT has these discussions around teams, and teams working together. It's so easy when you're in an organization where you have bright, talented people for ideas to take on a life of their own, because an individual is promoting that idea, but to Lydia's point about collaboration, that is a, an important shift in the world as well as in business. And I, I've got a granddaughter in college, and one of the things they do, they do, professor, which we have a professor here beside us as well, is a lot of team projects. Um, and, and, and in the moment, the students go, oh God, I gotta work with somebody else. Yeah, it's called life. You will always have to work with someone else, but how you work together so collaboration delivers a better product than what I could do individually, that's the trick. That's a huge shift. Um, there's this quote, if you wanna go fast, go alone. You wanna go far, go together. We need a go together culture and that's what we're working toward. Yeah, I think we're almost there. Hi, good afternoon. I'm excited to be here, and this has been an amazing conversation. So my name is Sandra. I'm with um, a lifestyle publication called Role Model Magazine here in Columbus. And we're all about really building confidence in girls. So as you speak about Victoria's Secrets trying to reach that, um, to speak to her, I mean, speaking to me, who's her at 40, I'm able to look at a Victoria's Secret model and feel confident that I don't need to be her. I can go into the shop and confident, confidently look at the bodies and not feel that I need to change or shift. So how are you speaking to that 16-year-old her as she transitions from you know, the Walmart brand to now trying to fit into this new you know, body and then seeing different models and you know, obviously with confidence that are at her age, how, do you, how are you guys talking to her to make sure that she doesn't feel some sort of way when she looks at your models or your representation? I'll just start, um, but definitely want to make sure Lydia jumps in here because <clears throat> some of the things that we're talking about broadly 
is in particular because of that 15, 16 year old who is very, very vulnerable to perceptions of self while she is creating her own sense of self. And so the big deal about even showing body diversity is about self-acceptance, um, that it is okay that I am the way I am. There's nothing wrong with me. Um, I, I uh, was on vacation once and this little girl came up to me, we were at the pool together and she said to me, why is your skin so much darker than mine? And her mother was there lying at the pool and she didn't cringe, she didn't say anything. I don't know if she heard the conversation or not. And she was the imperfectly innocent. If she had not seen me or felt comfortable asking that question, that could have done something to her own confidence level. I knew that was a pivotal moment in my trying to answer her question. And I said, well, God makes flowers all different colors too. I said, and we love the flowers. They smell differently. They grow. I said, yeah, that's why my skin's different from yours. And she said, oh, okay, and then proceeded to want to play something, right? Um, so we are very much aware, and you know, we try to get there through our pink brand, but also the overarching values that we have in the VS brand or the Adore Me brand includes that as well, because that value of self doesn't go away with age, but it is nurtured at a very young age. I'd build on what Donna said. The, the other piece is when you think about our brand, particularly pink, the content is evolving. So it's not just images of one body type or one person without storytelling behind it, right? You, when you see our brand, you see a lot more opportunity for the stories behind the content that you're seeing, which also helps people to relate and put things together just to say this isn't just one one person and I have to look like this person. Also the um, inclusion of influencers now, right? So you're not just seeing a model or a supermodel, you're also seeing real women, real body types, and you're seeing that, that these are real people. So I think that helps in that in helping young women to not see one thing and think that they have to be that one thing because it's a, it's a more holistic viewpoint of what's real um, than maybe historically what you've seen. Thank you. <clears throat> we have uh, about one minute left for one final question. Um, it might be the most challenging yet. Uh, what is next for Donna James? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, we'll have to ask her. Oh, that's me. Yeah, what's next for Donna James? I, you know, I can't answer that question without thinking about Larry James. And so the what next for me is about what next for us. And we are living our best life, at least the best life that we know so far. Um, and each year it just gets better. So what's next for me? is to hopefully and prayerfully continue to live in a place of growth and love um, in everything I touch and do. Um, I don't have any big plans. I'm not running for office. Plenty of people doing that. I'm not uh, uh, you know, planning to start a new business. I got plenty on my plate. I love what I do. And um, I'm just prayerful I can continue to do what I love a little longer um, and stay in love a lot longer. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to just hand it over to you, Sherry. It's all, you. all right. Thank you so much. Uh, I regret for this to come to a close, but let's not stop having this conversation. That was really important stuff. Um, I hope you found today's forum as interesting as I did. I know one takeaway I will think about is how not to waste the potential of a pivot. That will give us something to really think about on our drives out of here or 
as you click off your computers, for those of you who are out there. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again to our forum sponsors, to the United Way of Central Ohio, to Rama Consulting, to Crab Brown and James, and to the Ellis for your continued support. We want to thank our virtual seat patrons, to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation, and to the Columbus Dispatch. And a very, very special and warm thank you to today's speakers, Donna James, Lydia Smith, and Kimberly Miner. And good news, we're on again next week, so please come back. You can register now for next week's forum, Reattaching Historic Neighborhoods to Downtown Columbus, which will also feature the winner of the 2023 Harrison Smith Award for Excellence in Downtown Development. Again, thank you so much. We could not do this without you. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.